it appears Kalia Karuni is set to make an appearance on a top rank show at the end of this month, January 29th, at the Hard Rock Hotel Casino in Tulsa. Against an opponent that has yet to be announced. I don't know that this is an audition for Kalia Karuni to perhaps enter into a multi fight deal, some kind of a pact with the people over there at top rank. This could also be interpreted as Kalia Karuni being groomed as an opponent for the reigning Super Featherweight Champion. Unified Super Featherweight Champion. Mikalayla Mayer. This could just be a one off situation. Like what we saw in 2020 when Yvonne Michelle's fighter fights under the Jim promotional banner. Jim is based out of Canada. Like what we saw when Kim Clavel made an appearance on a top-ranked show in the bubble during the shutdown in 2020. This may not herald a multi-fight deal or a multi-fight situation. It might not. What it might be is top rank grooming a potential opponent for Michaela Mayer. Yeah, that might be what this is. Up until recently, I had thought that Kalia Karuni might end up challenging for the green belt, might end up challenging for the WBC title. It being that Kalia Karuni is in possession of a lesser version of the full title. I believe that Kalia Karuni is currently in possession of the WBC's silver title. Thus, that can be interpreted as Kalia Karuni angling for a WBC title shot, WBC world title opportunity. But with her making an appearance on a top rank show, you get the sense that she might be shifting her focus. She might want to challenge Michaela Mayer for the two world titles that she's got. The WBC is not among them. The WBC title is in the possession of... At least your bump gotten has got that one. So Kalia Karuni is set to make an appearance on a top-ranked show January 29th against an opponent that has yet to be announced. This is supposed to be on the undercard of Robson Conceição versus Javier Martinez. Robson Conceição, who lost his last fight to Oscar Valdez. A decision loss that had a lot of people scratching their heads. I saw a lot of people thinking Robson Conceição did enough to get the decision. Not in my eyes, better still. Robson Conceição, the amateur standout, suffered his first professional loss, and he will attempt to rebound off that loss against Javier Martinez. Kalia Karuni is set to make an appearance on that undercard. Keep your eyes peeled for that at the end of this month in Tulsa. That's at the end of this month. Next month. On the 5th, on the undercard of Eubank versus Williams. We know that Clarissa Shields is set to be making her Sky Sports Boxer debut against unbeaten Emma Kozin of Slovenia, but also on the undercard. Carolyn Dubois is supposed to be making her pro debut. Carolyn Dubois, the Olympian. Carolyn Dubois, the younger sister of Daniel Dubois, Dynamite Daniel Dubois. She's going to be taking on experienced journeywoman Vaida Maisokaite. Vaida Maisokaite, who's for the who's who of fighters. Beck Connolly, Chantel Cameron, Kalia Karuni, who I just mentioned, Kalia Karuni, who I just talked about. She's fought Rhiannon Dixon. Last Last year, she fought Ebony Jones and Natasha Jonas. She capped off the year, suffering another professional loss to Rihanna Dixon, who she's fought more than once. Carolyn Dubois is going to beat the shit out of this girl. Carolyn Dubois, the amateur standout Carolyn Dubois, the blue chip prospect set to make her professional debut, her Sky Sports and Boxer debut. I think Carolyn's going to beat the crap out of either my Sokaite. Carolyn Dubois, who's 21 years old. Carolyn Dubois, who's only 21 years old. Lots of shelf life, lots of upside in this young fighter's career, which is all ahead of this her. This fight with Vaida Maisokaita is a lightweight contest. Lightweight, that's 135 pounds. That's where Katie Taylor reigns as that division's undisputed champion. I don't think that a Dubois versus Taylor fight is right around the corner. I don't think it's anyways near close to that fight. If I'm being honest, I think that Katie Taylor might be retired before Carolyn Dubois is ready to challenge for a world title. I think what we're going to see in Carolyn Dubois' career is a lot of familiar faces. Faces that we've seen against Katie Taylor perhaps Chantel Cameron, some other fighters, matchroom Valkyries. I expect to see Ana Sanchez, Victoria Bustos. Fighters that matchroom's Valkyries have fought before. Some of them, like Rose Vellante. Seasoned journeywomen, contenders, former champions. These are the fighters I expect to see Carolyn Dubois opposite the ring of in the next one to two, maybe even three years before she's ready to challenge for a world title. I understand that Carolyn is an amateur standout, and I understand that oftentimes amateur standouts are moved quickly in the pro ranks. But the politics of boxing, at least when it comes to lightweights, it is an issue because Katie Taylor is in possession of all the belts. So long as the rivalry exists between boxer and matchroom. Sky Sports and the Zone. So long as that's going on, the lightweight division is a political environment, an environment where certain fights may not happen as a result of those politics. Thus, Don't get me wrong, I think we're a ways out from Carolyn Dubois challenging for a title. She hasn't even made her pro debut yet. That's two weeks, better still. 
On the off chance that Katie Taylor is still around in a year, two, three years, reigning as this division's undisputed champion, politics are something you have to think about. Politics might be a problem. We'll see how it plays out. So in the mean in between time, they've got to keep Carolyn Dubois busy and they have to groom her, develop her as a fighter. One way to do it is to have her fight common opponents with the likes of a Katie Taylor, a Chantel Cameron, those fighters. Expect to see Carolyn Dubois in action and expect to see her in action often. Against familiar faces, faces you've seen before. That's what I think the immediate future holds for young Carolyn Dubois. And it all kicks off two weeks from now on the undercard of Eubank versus Williams. In other news, former two-division champion Tim Bradley says, Spence is running away from Terrence Crawford. I'm worried about his eye in the Yugas fight. You know that Tim Bradley's one of the only guys I've seen make light of that? He literally is. The former champion was quoted as saying, Yes, Spence is a next-level super type of fighter. I believe that. But I still think he's running from Terrence Crawford, to be honest with you. How do I see Spence versus Ugas? It's a tough fight, but an easier fight than Terence Crawford. Jordanis Ugas, he's a waiter. He's a counterpuncher. We've seen Errol in the ring against counterpunchers. Danny Garcia was a counterpuncher. And Mikey Garcia was a counterpuncher. We've seen that. We've seen what? We've seen what Spence can do against those types of guys. He can orchestrate his jab from the outside. He can dominate from the outside. And he can come around the guards of these guys. He can dictate the pace. That's what he's going to do against Ugas. My only concern in this fight is Spence's eye. You got to understand, you can have no hand. You can have no feet. You gotta have eyes to be able to see in the ring. And when one of your lenses is messed up, you've gotta understand that tells your brain what you're seeing. Your eyes are telling your brain what you're seeing. So I think with Spence, I'm worried about his eye. It's not gonna be 100%. Once you get surgery on something, it's never the same. It's different. Over the summer, Spence announced he'd suffered a torn left retina that required surgery days before his August 21st scheduled fight against Manny Pacquiao. Yugas ended up serving as a late replacement opponent, and he upset the legendary Filipino fighter in a convincing unanimous decision victory. Like I said, Tim Bradley is the only guy I see making light of this. Errol Spence Jr.'s fans, they seem more than happy with the matchup. The fact that Errol Spence Jr. is returning in what's said to be a welterweight unification match, not realizing that their prize stallion and their pony in this welterweight show could be walking into a genuine banana skin kind of situation. A year of inactivity. A torn left retina. They must think it's still 2017 and Errol Spence is in peak physical form. No, they must think that this is the same Errol Spence Jr. that fought Kel Brock all those years ago. But the Spence that lies before us here today is a far less active and far less solid fighter than he used to be. And I think all of this... I don't think enough people are making enough light of this. But former world champion Tim Bradley did. Tim Bradley who said, going into Spence versus you, Gus, I wonder about coordination, how Spence is feeling and how he's seeing and all these things are affected by his vision so i think it's going to be a good fight bradley said i think spence will come out on top but i think it's a challenging fight for him in that sense stylistically i think his style favors you guys yeah but physically is he up to the task is he up for the job that's the question how many punches to that left eye is it going to take before it starts acting up and those are genuine concerns those are genuine questions because Jordanis Ugas, last I checked, he's not in there to have a tickle fight with Errol Spence Jr., is he? This is the hurt business. And for all of the praise that Jordanis Ugas lavishes on Errol Spence Jr., at the end of the day, once that opening bell sounds, they ain't buddies anymore. Well, he's gonna try to put a hurting on that guy. This is what you have to think about. What are you expecting? You expecting Jordanis Ugas to pull his punches on Errol Spence Jr., not target the left eye that got worked on? I mean, seriously, what are you expecting? What do you think? It's written in the contract that he don't punch him in the eye. We're talking about a boxing match. If a boxing match is what Errol Spence Jr. is about to have with Jordanis Ugas, and Jordanis Ugas' aim is to beat Errol Spence Jr. and take his two world titles, then that eye, whether you like it or not, it's a target. Errol Spence Jr., he hasn't fought anybody since 2020, late 2020, when he took on Danny Gersha. Jordanis Ugas is not Danny Gersha. So let's get that right out of the way. I don't see enough people making light of how this fight is a potential banana skin for Errol Spence Jr. Errol, who is so obviously taking the path of least resistance by choosing to unify with Jordanis Ugas as opposed to Terrence Crawford. There's been a demand the last three or four years for Errol to finally fight with that guy. He doesn't want to do that. If he's okay to unify with Ugas, why is he not okay to unify with Crawford now that Crawford's a free agent? He's not with Top Rank and ESPN anymore. In fact, he's suing Top Rank. All that aside, he's free to fight. Errol Spence Jr., 
That fight still doesn't seem like a priority to him. Why Ugas and not Crawford? Obvious reasons. Yo, Dennis Ugas isn't a pound-for-pound -pound fighter. He's not a three-division champion. Ugas is a safer choice than Crawford, and everybody knows it. Though there aren't very many safe places to hide for a guy who's been out a full 12 months. A guy who had his left eye operated on due to a torn retina. Boxers put themselves in harm's way every single time they get out there. Active boxers, one's more active than Errol Spence Jr. has been. It's an occupational hazard. It comes with the job, but for Errol... Well, I guess Tim Bradley's one of the few people that notices this is a potential banana skin. You can't downplay the severity of this injury if it resulted in Errol Spence Jr. being benched for all of 2021. You can't downplay the potential banana skin this might be when you take stock of Errol Spence Jr.'s physical condition and what it might be behind closed doors. I agree with Tim. The eye is a concern. And just in keeping with the theme of welterweight news, Ennis, Jaron Boots Ennis, expects to fight two, three times, win a world title in 2022, no more games, I'm not playing. This is the year for me to take over Ennis told FightHype.com. Like I said before, I'm expecting to get at least one belt this year and then on to the next, bigger and better. Ennis expects to fight several times this year depending on the magnitude of the bouts. He will enter training camp towards the end of January, he said. Honestly, probably two or three fights. But if we can get two big fights, that would be great. Ennis said, I gotta stay busy. Cognizant of the sport's crippling politics. Yeah, politics is why the welterweight division is the way it is. Ennis believes he can cut through the business as long as he continues to dazzle inside of the ring after a long period of feasting on lower opposition. My honest opinion is that he's ready to fight for a world title now. They can't keep putting me to the side, Ennis said, of the champions in his division. I'm gonna make my statement in this boxing game in the welterweight division. I will start this year. And Jaron Boots Ennis really is caught in the crossfire of one of the more political weight classes in the sport of boxing. The welterweight division and it's tough if terence crawford and terence crawford fight wasn't a big enough incentive for the guys over there at the pbc to make a fight with him what chance does jaron boots ennis stand he's a high risk low reward guy for everybody he obviously doesn't have a big enough following to where facing him comes with an added financial incentive he's not in possession of any world titles i don't think most people realize that he's not a pbc fighter and that adds to how complicated this situation is jaron boots ennis himself said i will be a world champion this year no more games. I'm not playing. I'm here to take over the division. Conquering the 147-pound division is just the start. The switch hitting Ennis envisions himself becoming a three-division world champion at some point. Trying to be undisputed welterweight world champion and then go do the same thing at 154 and 160, Ennis said. It's the start right here. Jaron Ennis' next fight is supposed to be an IBF final eliminator. And Canadian's own Custio Clayton seems to be the front runner for that final eliminator. It might come down to Jaron Boots Ennis versus Custio Clayton to decide who will be the IBF's next mandatory challenger for the winner of Spence versus Ugas, which we just talked about. The thing is, the winner of that fight might have to deal with the winner of Butaev versus Stanionis, a Montes Stanionis who stepped aside and allowed that welterweight unification bout to go on. If Stanionis beats Butaev, he might have first dibs on the winner of that fight. Jaron Boots Ennis will have to continue to wait. That's a situation you want to pay attention to. A proliferation of mandatory challengers by way of separate alphabet organizations lining up for the winner of Spence versus Yugas. There's the winner of Butaev versus Stanionis and the potential winner of what could be Ennis versus Clayton, Canadian-based Custio Clayton, who I saw in action against Sergei Lipinets, and I like what I saw. A young, unbeaten fighter who can move and punch. It's a decent acid test for Jerem Boots Ennis. Custio Clayton fought two times in 2020, capped off the year facing Sergei Lipinets. He fought only once last year. He fought journeyman Cameron Crowell just above welterweight, and won a unanimous decision maintaining his unbeaten record. He might be the guy that Jaron Boots Ennis ends up fighting for that Mando spot. Custio Clayton doesn't have the profile of a Keith Thurman, a Sean Porter, a Danny Garcia, certainly not the profile of an Errol Spence Jr., but I have to say, that's a solid fight, that's a solid acid test for Jaron Boots Ennis. Jaron Boots Ennis, who's been plowing through the guys he has been fighting, though those guys really weren't on the up and up in all the ways that Custio Clayton yeah, with Custio, it's a battle of the unbeatens. He'd be facing a young and primed fighter who knows how to move and punch, make himself a moving target. Let's see if 
Jaron Boots Ennis can still rack up the knockouts against the guy whose feet aren't pinned to the ground. But beyond that fight, there's still reconciliation that's needed. Because even if Jaron Ennis goes on and wins that fight, he won't be the only mandatory challenger for the winner of Spence versus Yugos. Jaron Ennis's promotional situation is unique. He's not an according to Hoyle PBC fighter. He's more akin to a Showtime fighter because his promoter has an exclusivity deal with Showtime. So you won't see Jaron Boots Ennis fighting on Fox. Not unless his promotional situation changes. You know, I don't know when Jaron Ennis's contract with that promoter is going to expire. I don't know exactly when his promotional situation is going to change. But until it does, he may not have access to those PBC fighters. The ones that remain since Danny Garcia has stated he's going up to 154 pounds. Sean Porter, he's retired. There's still Keith Thurman, but Keith Thurman seems to have his eye on the winner of... Keith Thurman's trying to get a fight with the winner of Spence versus Ugas, the same as Jaron Boots Ennis. And it's not likely that Keith Thurman gives Jaron Boots Ennis the time of day, though in an ideal world, a former champion like a Keith Thurman, who really only has one professional loss on his record, in an ideal world, he'd fight the likes of a Jaron Boots Ennis to show that he's still got it, to show that he's still one of the best fighters in the world. He wouldn't be fighting a guy who got knocked out at 140 in his last fight and has done absolutely nothing in the welterweight division. But this is boxing. These are the politics. These are the breaks for Jaron Boots Ennis. In an ideal world, we'd be getting Ennis versus Thurman. The opportunity for Jaron Ennis to make a statement by potentially stopping Keith Thurman because I think he would. Yeah, if given the chance. But I don't think for a second Keith Thurman is going to put himself in harm's way like that should he beat my Mario Barrios. I don't think Keith Thurman is going to give Jaron Boots Ennis that kind of opportunity. Thus, this is the landscape, and here we are. 